I'm sorry for the wait. Um, sometimes the good things make us wait. So we hope this will be a fantastic seminar that you will all enjoy. Uh, we are happy to have today to hear to Josep Diviteto, who has been, uh, has done several postdocs in Uppsala University, Oviedo, and Padova. And as far as I understand, he's moving very soon to start a, a faculty position in Rome. So he's going to tell us about non-perturbative instability of M2A on ADS4 process 6. So whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Rene, for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm, I really want to apologize for uh, some technical problems uh, that I've been having. So finally, <laughs> we are ready to start. So I'll do my best to still uh, try and finish in time. Uh, OK, so uh, what I'll be talking about uh, is based on uh, some uh, work late last year uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Peter Bowmans, uh, who is uh, currently a postdoc in Padova, and Davide Cassani, uh, who is uh, here in Padova as a staff member, and uh, Nicolo Petri, who recently moved uh, to Israel uh, for a postdoc. So uh, let me give you a brief outline of my talk. I'll start uh, by giving you some introduction and motivation. Um, towards this work. And then uh, I'll uh, dive into the topic of uh, uh, bubbles of nothing as possible uh, non-perturbative instabilities by first uh, reviewing uh, Witten's original example. And then uh, I'll try to discuss uh, some further generalizations thereof. And in particular, I'll uh, introduce you with uh, a novel uh, object, which we called uh, the Dilaton bubble. And then uh, I'll try to uh, see how this can be applied to our uh, massive 2A setup to discuss uh, non-perturbative instability of uh, a certain type of uh, massive 2A vacuum. And then uh, I'll uh, discuss some uh, different regimes that, the, that a possible solution to the field equations should have. And finally, see how one can uh, pick boundary conditions to perform explicit numerical integration. And uh, I'll come to discussing some physical properties of the solution and finally I'll conclude. So uh, as you're probably all familiar with, uh, uh, if we want to extract uh, low energy uh, effective physics from string theory, we need uh, the mechanism of uh, flux compactification to get rid of uh, the extra dimensions which need to be there in the UV per consistency uh, by uh, fixing all the size and shape of the extra dimensions uh, uh, by giving them a mass and, uh, and fluxes and extra ingredients are what's needed in order for this mechanism to work. Uh, under certain conditions, uh, the, the effective lower dimensional description of the reduced theory is uh, gravity coupled to a bunch of scalar fields plus other fields which will not be relevant for today's discussion. And then uh, sitting in a vacuum means that uh, all of these scalar fields that parameterize the size and shape of extra dimensions are uh, fixed to some uh, VEVs, uh, constant VEVs, phi naught. And then the effective cosmological constant is given by uh, the value of the scalar potential at the, at the web's phi naught. Then uh, perturbative stability is ensured once the, the so-called mass matrix, which is essentially the, the Hessian of the scalar potential evaluated in the vacuum, is, uh, has non-negative eigenvalues for Minkowski and the Sitter vacuum. And uh, in the case of ADS, it may also have negative uh, eigenvalues as long as they're above the Brighton Lohner Friedman bounds. Then, uh, of course, once uh, perturbative stability is established, what about non perturbative stability? Uh, let me first say that this is a very hard question because so mainly two reasons. The first one is that uh, path integrals in quantum gravity are uh, not well understood, to say the least, or Perhaps I should say that they're not understood at all. And secondly, uh, 
it's because in principle, you're never done checking possible decay channels. Uh, there might be still uh, something out there that nobody has ever thought about and still uh, affect uh, our vacuum at a non-perturbative level. Uh, besides being a hard question, um, it is also a very relevant question, uh, namely because, uh, well, from a, uh, from a string theory side, uh, this will eventually tell uh, what the ultimate fate is of the string landscape. And uh, when uh, speaking about holographic interpretations of uh, anti-desitter vacuum, uh, non-perturbative stability is uh, strictly required if you, uh, for a vacuum to have, uh, to have a holographic dual. And this is essentially because anything I put in the, um, in the bulk of ADS uh, reaches the boundary within finite time and hence uh, instantaneously kills the, the would-be boundary CFT. When it comes to discussing possible types of non-perturbative instabilities, we find uh, bubbles of nothing or uh, CDL bubbles, so Coleman and DeLuca bubbles. Uh, these are, should be thought of as uh, uh, transitions from, uh, from a false to a true vacuum and possibly more things. But today we'll be mainly focusing on uh, bubbles of nothing. So uh, just a few words done, at maybe that. If I yeah. can interrupt quickly, you say that you sure. are never done checking instabilities but yeah. you can try to check if there is some sort of positive energy theorem. And then you know that's that- That's right, but that's stable, true. Right? That's right. Uh, I've also been involved in, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, research recently, but uh, we should all mention that uh, very often uh, positive energy theorems have uh, assumptions. And in particular, it's very hard to derive uh, positive energy theorems uh, in presence of sources. So usually uh, it's, uh, it's kind of conceivable to prove a positive energy theorem that protects you from uh, uh, smooth bubbles. It's a lot harder to make sure uh, you're also protected from uh, uh, stuff supported by a source singularity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, this goes a bit, uh, in this, uh, along the same lines as um, as Maldacena Nunez uh, Nogo theorems for like uh, the sitter vacuum. Uh, it, once you once you have a source, then uh, it's a lot harder to prove like inequalities for uh, for the on shell action. Okay, so just a few words about uh, the swamp plant conjectures and uh, and why this kind of study might be. Uh, relevant uh, within uh, this field of research. So as probably most of you are familiar with, uh, by swamp blank conjectures, we mean uh, a whole set of uh, requirements that uh, effective field theories uh, should satisfy once uh, coupled to gravity in order for them to consistently admit uh, AUV completion. In particular, uh, if we think of uh, uh, a consistent quantum gravity theory as being uh, string theory, then uh, uh, once you go to low energies, starting from, uh, uh, from string theory, a whole bunch of uh, possible low energy theories open up. And in particular, it's been uh, conjectured uh, a few years ago that uh, non-supersymmetric uh, ADS vacua uh, should always be unstable uh, within a consistent uh, string theory compacted application. This uh, is exactly what goes under the name of uh, the ADS one plane conjecture. In some sense, uh, it can be seen as uh, a, a coming from a stronger version of the weak gravity conjecture, uh, where uh, uh, we see that uh, any consistent quantum gravity theory must include microscopic charged objects in the spectrum. In this case, uh, here I'm formulating it for extended objects with the p plus one uh, dimensional word volume. And microscopic means that the tension uh, should not exceed 
uh, the charge in Planck units. In particular, uh, a stronger version of, uh, of this uh, weak gravity conjecture states that saturation can only occur in supersymmetric scenarios. Uh, if this were true, then this would uh, probably suggest as a consequence that, as I said before, all non-supersymmetric ADS vacua must be ultimately unstable to microscopic charged membrane nucleation. This was proposed by Oguri and Wafa uh, a few years ago. Then, of course, uh, our plan uh, in some sense is to, uh, to test this within uh, uh, known candidate uh, metastable uh, non supersymmetric ADS vacuum and string theory. Let me now take a step back and review uh, Witten's bubble of nothing, which dates back in uh, 1982. Uh, this is a, uh, a smooth bubble geometry that uh, was obtained by performing a double analytic continuation uh, of a Schwarzschild black hole in five dimensions. So as you can see here, the, uh, the double analytic continuation uh, uh, turns the black hole time into a, a, a periodic circle coordinate, which is psi here then the, the warp factor F is a function of rho exactly like, uh, like it is uh, for the, the Schwarzschild black hole. And what used to be the spherical uh, horizon of the black hole is now turned back into Lorentzian signature and it becomes a, a the sitter space. As you can see this, uh, of course, uh, the, the performing the double analytic continuation does not uh, change the fact that this was a solution to the field of equations, but then of course uh, it might crucially affect uh, its global properties, and in particular the range of definition of the of the radial coordinate. So while it used to be possible to uh, continue the rho coordinate from infinity all the way to zero across the horizon place that rho equals capital R, uh, now in this uh, different real slicing. The, the, the range of definition of the, road, of the radial coordinate stops at rho equals r. And of course, the nature of this uh, singularity at rho equals r is still uh, of a coordinate type. And uh, in particular, if, uh, provided that psi has the right periodicity, uh, I can avoid the presence of uh, conical singularity and hence have a completely uh, smooth uh, 5D metric. And uh, this interpolates between uh, a Desider 3 cross R2 close to, uh, at the location of the bubble wall at rho equals R. And then uh, at infinity, it recovers the Minkowski vacuum of 5D gravity, which is uh, Minkowski 4 cross S1. So in some sense, this can be seen as an instability of, uh, of the underlying Minkowski 4 vacuum. In particular, uh, if we take a look at what happens uh, uh, inside of the bulk in, uh, in global coordinates in Minkowski 4, uh, an observer at infinity would see uh, that a, a hole of nothing is cut at the center of space at radius uh, capital R, and this, uh, and this hole starts expanding uh, in time and uh, the expansion rate uh, quickly reaches uh, the speed of light, as you can see. So this would mean that then uh, uh, whatever uh, observer in the, in the bulk would eventually be eaten up by this uh, bubble of nothing. So uh, this was done uh, many years ago. And uh, if we want to uh, try and cook up a similar mechanism uh, uh, for strain compactifications, uh, there's several steps to go. Uh, we need to generalize uh, this kind of geometries to include uh, the possibility of having a negative cosmological constant, so no longer doing it in, uh, in flat space. Then we need the higher dimensional uh, compact and non-compact spaces in strain compactifications and possibly we need to include the presence of flux, 
non-trivial inco-homology. Uh, some of these features, uh, generalizations, uh, have been discussed uh, in the uh, recent and not so recent years uh, in the literature. In particular, uh, going higher dimensions, both uh, for what's regarding uh, the compactification manifold and the external manifold, was uh, discussed by uh, even some people in the audience uh, two years ago. And um, in particular, in their work, uh, what is discussed is uh, the possibility of having uh, obstructions towards the existence of uh, smooth bubble solutions. And these obstructions, uh, as noted by the authors, are of, of two different types. Uh, they can be uh, global obstructions, so obstructions uh, regarding the, the spin structure of the internal manifold. And this is exactly uh, what happens in, uh, in Whitman's case, uh, as we'll see in a second. And uh, in case such obstructions are absent, uh, what might be protecting a vacuum is a weaker obstruction, which is dynamical. So in the end, I have to be able to solve uh, Einstein's equations and uh, generate the right energy momentum tensor that might support uh, the existence of this bubble. Namely, uh, what we need is to, uh, to violate the dominant energy condition. So uh, if we take a look in particular at the, uh, the spin bordism group in, um, of the compact space, so this MD, as uh, the dimension of the compact space varies, I might have uh, uh, different situations. So the, the case in which the compactification manifold is one dimensional uh, is exactly Witten's case. And as you can see, the, the spin bordism group in this case is a, is a Z2. And uh, this turns out to be exactly uh, what protects uh, a, a putative supersymmetric vacuum uh, uh, obtained by compactification on a circle, thanks to the periodic boundary conditions that the fermions require. Uh, on the other side, of course, uh, if no supersymmetry and hence no globally defined spinners are there, uh, such a protection is no longer there and uh, I, can, uh, I can have bubbles of nothing. Then uh, in, uh, in higher dimensions, things get more complicated because uh, in some cases, and in particular, the one which is uh, uh, of interest uh, to us, that is the case of a six dimensional internal manifold, the spin bordism group is trivial, which means that no uh, global obstruction to the existence of bubbles will be there. But then uh, uh, the difference between SUSI and non SUSI uh, has to be of a dynamical type. Uh, the advantage in our case uh, will be that uh, because we are in ADS, uh, we won't need to uh, include uh, uh, special uh, uh, dominant energy condition violating uh, effects, such as uh, the inclusion of higher derivatives, because in ADS, this is uh, violated classically. Uh, however, of course, uh, let me stress that the case that we want to study uh, is a high level of complication because it essentially requires uh, all three generalization named in the previous slides uh, all together at the same time. So uh, let's not get there uh, immediately. And uh, let me one, first this one question. Yeah. So yeah. just to, to make sure. Um, so you are saying that since the dominant energy condition is violated by the ADS, the vacuum energy, yeah. Um, yeah. if the bubble of nothing is allowed topologically, you are saying that it will always be allowed dynamically? Uh, I mean, you don't have to take into account the dominant energy condition subst subtracting the, the vacuum energy contribution? No, well, uh, no, I, I, I don't mean that. Uh, I just mean that uh, at least uh, you don't need to add uh, things like higher derivatives in ADS. 
So you are saying that then of it course. can allow topologically, then it will always expand, that there is never a dynamical obstruction? Or... No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that uh, no extra ingredients are needed in principle uh, to find these bubble solutions. Then, of course, uh, you still have to solve the equations. I'm not saying that it will be there automatically. So you are thinking that even if you violate the dominant energy condition, you, maybe you don't find a solution anyway? Exactly. This, uh, this is still a possibility. Okay, so you think it's not a sufficient condition this to violate the dominant energy condition? No, at least I never thought it was. Uh, do, do, do you have uh, I thought they were sufficient. I thought argument it was why equivalent it to violate this energy condition than to find a solution to the Einstein equations. But it would be nice, yeah, like to understand. Okay. Uh, I, like to see if there is any counter example, no? That you cannot find a solution, yet you violate the energy condition. Yeah, okay. This, uh, this I'm not sure I must say, and I, I don't have a counter example to this. Uh, I was just suggesting that, uh, I was just trying to justify why in ADS you can find uh, uh, solutions without uh, need for higher derivatives. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, uh, still staying uh, in, in flat space, but in a, in higher dimensions. For instance, if we start. Uh, uh, okay, one might have uh, slightly more general things than uh, than traditional Kaluza Klein bubbles. So, in particular, uh, there could be another would be modulus that shrinks at the location of the bubble wall, which does not, strictly speaking, represent the, the physical size of an internal cycle. Uh, this, for instance, happens if I start uh, up in 11 dimensions by taking a, a, a Schwarzschild 5 cross uh, a Ricci flat uh, 6 manifold. This is, of course, uh, a solution to, uh, to the field equations. And then uh, I can uh, perform a double analytic continuation uh, just like it's done in, uh, in Witten's case. So the, the black hole time now becomes a periodic circle coordinate and the horizon uh, is now weak rotated to the sitter three. Uh, and then uh, in 11 dimensions, I obtain something that looks pretty much like a, a bubble of nothing geometry cross uh, a Ricci flat six manifold. If I now uh, perform a, a circle reduction to go down to, uh, to 10 dimensions, uh, what I obtain is uh, a, um, a, singular, a singular geometry, uh, though which has a, a finite Euclidean action. And at the location of the bubble wall, which is again, uh, rho equals r, uh, nothing, uh, there is nothing that's, that shrinks in the geometry, but then uh, the string coupling goes to zero. And uh, uh, still, formally speaking, uh, uh, nothing uh, very different happens for a lower dimensional observer, uh, as uh, you can see uh, from here, in the sense that uh, a 4D observer living in what used to be the vacuum would see exactly uh, the same thing that happened uh, in, uh, in Witten's case. That is to say that uh, suddenly at rho equals r, uh, space time ends, and then the, uh, and there's this uh, bubble of nothing that uh, starts expanding and uh, eating up everything. Uh, in all of this, of course, the compactification manifold uh, is, uh, is a spectator, so nothing here happens. So I, I apologize, in this figure, there is a six here, which will be eventually what's re relevant to us. But so far, I've been talking about a Ricci flat manifold. Uh, to get to the six here, we need uh, to further uh, work. But this will be eventually uh, the, the picture of uh, our intermediate bubble solution. So now, uh, let me briefly discuss uh, the setup in which we want to apply all of this. So uh, there is a class of uh, massive 2A uh, 
compactifications on a six-dimensional nearly killer manifold uh, that has uh, ADS for vacuum. And uh, this truncation was studied uh, like roughly uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And uh, it's a consistent truncation to a four-dimensional uh, uh, N equals two supergravity restricted to the uh, universal hypermultiplet. And uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, fluxes of NSNS an and, and Ramon Ramon type, but uh, the only one uh, which is known trivially in cohomology is uh, uh, F6 entirely wrapping internal space. So it's a, like a, of a Freund Rubin type. And uh, one can study this by taking a look at an effective model where uh, uh, we have a bunch of scalar fields, these uh, phi, b, theta, uh, and u, which are, as I said, a uh, universal hypermultiplet, and they they are subject to a, a scalar potential, which is the last two lines of the slides. And then uh, we want to add uh, an excitation of the four-dimensional metric, which is uh, uh, described by this function, capital A of R, that parameterizes the Sitter the 3 slicing of the 4D metric. Uh, under certain conditions, uh, this uh, slicing describes uh, the expanding bubble that we're looking for. Then, of course, uh, the first thing that this truncation contains it's, uh, is a bunch of critical points, uh, preserving G2 residual symmetry. Uh, there is a supersymmetric vacuum, which is the last one in this table. And it, uh, as I said, it preserves G2 residual symmetry. And then there's two non-supersymmetric uh, pseudo vacuum. The first one uh, even has uh, enhanced bosonic symmetry. It's, it preserves uh, SO7. And then uh, another one, uh, still non-supersymmetric, uh, strictly preserves G2. Uh, so while the first non-supersymmetric vacuum with enhanced symmetry uh, already exhibits uh, perturbative instabilities in the, uh, within uh, the, the supergravity description, uh, uh, the strictly G2 one uh, is very interesting because it's been proven to be uh, perturbatively fully stable in the sense that uh, two years ago, Guarino, Malek, and Sampleben even computed uh, the full kaluza klein spectrum by using uh, uh, exceptional geometry, exceptional field theory techniques. And they could prove that it's completely tachyon free. So this would be a candidate uh, metastable uh, non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum that might, in principle, be a counterexample to the auguri Vafa ads one plank conjecture. So it's uh, definitely intriguing and worth looking into. So the complications of this situation are many. Let me start by the, the one uh, affecting most uh, our, uh, our study, which is the presence of flux uh, thread in internal space, which is non-trivial in cohomology which is F6, as I mentioned. Uh, so the fact that the uh, F6 uh, uh, is different than zero when integrated over the entire internal manifold uh, directly tells you that if you look for uh, uh, smoothly shrinking solutions where uh, space, internal space uh, uh, smoothly closes uh, like uh, at a cigar tip, then uh, you can see that uh, this would immediately lead to uh, a violation of Stokes' theorem. And hence, uh, one needs to include a source in order to make it up. So this means that the presence of flux, all in all, uh, if I look for uh, solutions where internal space closes, uh, then uh, we need small distance modifications. Then uh, a second complication is that the 4D geometry is, Minko is ADS and it's not Minkowski. So that will also tell you that uh, 
a would-be bubble solution uh, would also need uh, a large distance modification in order to asymptote to ADS and no longer to Minkowski. Then there are other complications with, uh, which are somewhat uh, subleading with respect to the first ones and still uh, important. Uh, the former one is that uh, the internal geometry is not richly flat like the one I described in the Dilaton bubble, but it's curved. And, it, and furthermore, it's richly scalar is different than zero. It's, uh, it's the six sphere. And the second complication is that uh, the Roman's mass is turned on. So that means that even like the 11 dimensional uh, interpretation that I told you about of the Dilaton bubble would not be there anymore. Uh, still, uh, this, this latter two complications uh, uh, will turn out to be uh, less important in, in the in interesting regime in the sense that they will only tell me that the, uh, the Dilaton bubble is only an approximate solution without uh, being a solution in itself. But this is uh, like analogous to what happens to uh, non-extremal objects that have like a near horizon geometry, which is only an approximate solution and it's not a solution in itself. So something similar will happen to us as well. So uh, let me discuss the different regimes that our, uh, our flows have. As I said, uh, there is an intermediate uh, bubble regime uh, where the solutions essentially look exactly like the Dilaton bubble, which is basically a, a solution with finite Euclidean action with uh, zero F6 flux and uh, asymptotically flat. And then uh, uh, the solution receives important uh, large distance modifications uh, yielding to the to an ADS four across S six uh, geometry, asymptotic geometry, and then uh, also small distance modifications due to the presence of a source, which will be of the form of uh, a D two brain, which is uh, smeared over uh, over internal space, the S six, the six sphere. Then uh, analytically, uh, this is exactly the situation that you will see. So uh, the reason why I write down uh, now, because we don't have much time, I don't want to bother you too much with the details, but the three functions that I write here in the table uh, represent, well, e to the phi is, is just the, yeah, the, the 10 D string dilaton. e to the u plus phi over four is the, is the word factor of the Desider three part of the metric. In the in the Einstein frame, and then uh, u to the e to the u plus a plus phi over four is uh, is the work factor in front of the six sphere in the Einstein frame. And then basically, what you can uh, you can see by plotting these uh, different uh, regimes together, there are there's a certain choice of initial conditions for which uh, one can realize. Uh, a sort of uh, smooth dynamical gluing between these three different regimes. Uh, then uh, what we did by, uh, to find the actual fully back reacted solution is to, is to choose appropriate initial conditions uh, at infinity, boundary conditions, by studying the linearized ADS uh, equations a la Pfefferman Graham, just in a different coordinate system. And then uh, uh, these parameter of the, uh, of the linearized expansion, which are chosen in such a way that the non-normalizable modes are killed and the normalizable modes are in principle arbitrary. Uh, then we further uh, constrain them by the requirements that our solution uh, uh, must have a good intermediate bubble regime. And as you can see, just by going back here, uh, basically uh, in the in this middle column here, you can see that uh, the warp factor of the six sphere, which is uh, e to the u plus phi over four, and e to the phi itself, the string dilaton, are exactly uh, each other's cube. 
So this means that basically, in order to have a good uh, bubble regime, I should start in the linearized uh, ADS uh, limit by a perturbation uh, uh, of the six sphere part of the metric and a dilaton, which are uh, uh, related by a factor of three. This further imposes uh, these two linear constraints on the coefficients of the linearized expansion and uh, gives a very good uh, uh, solution in that sense. This is uh, uh, the, these are the plots of the, of the actual dynamical flow that we obtain by numerically integrating the full system of equations. So no approximations involved. Uh, so the one on the left hand side is the, is the work factor of the sitter three. And then on the right hand side, we, we plot all of the other fields together. So the, the orange and the blue curve are uh, uh, the string dilaton and the work factor of, uh, of the six sphere. As you can see, they both asymptote a constant uh, uh, at large r, and they, and they shrink to zero uh, at small r. Actually, so the, the six sphere size does not shrink to zero, but this is in the, in the string frame. So if you were to plot it in the Einstein frame, you would just see that it approaches a constant as well. Uh, so then what we did was to compare the full solution, which is uh, in these plots, uh, the, the solid uh, thick blue line uh, with the, the three intermediate regimes. And as you can see, uh, the, the thick line that is the, the actual solution precisely realizes the, this dynamical interpolation between uh, uh, asymptotic regime, the red curve, uh, intermediate bubble regime, the, the green curve, and uh, the source regime, the yellow curve. So uh, let me just try to discuss some uh, open issues and physical properties so then I can <laughs> I can uh, I can conclude and leave you to some uh, some questions. So uh, this might uh, look like a, quote unquote an auguri vafa instability in the sense that uh, what what you see here is that the vacuum uh, uh, is eventually destroyed by the spontaneous nucleation uh, of a charged spherical membrane. Uh, now the question that you might ask is, uh, what can I tell about uh, the decay rate, uh, nucleation probability, and all of that? So unfortunately, this is uh, just like the one discussed in Horowitz, Ordera, and Polchinski in 2007 in the context of uh, non-supersymmetric orbifolds of ADS5 cross S5 in type 2b. Uh, there is a source. And in their case, the source was a spherical uh, smeared D3 brain. In our case, it's a spherical smeared D2 brain. So fairly similar. Uh, the problem is because there is a source, then the metric becomes singular once I get close to, uh, to the location of the, uh, of the bubble brain. And, and then I'm out of the supergravity approximation. I, I simply cannot trust it there. So there is no obvious way to evaluate the Euclidean action uh, and uh, reason uh, uh, like it's done usually. So in order to uh, be able to say something about the nucleation rate and all that, I need to come up with uh, a good subtraction mechanism to get rid of the, uh, the divergence uh, in, the, in the IR. Then uh, uh, another feature that might be uh, interesting to discuss is uh, what is the difference between supersymmetry and non-supersymmetry? Because I showed you in the beginning that in the setup, there's also a supersymmetric G2 preserving vacuum. What about a similar bubbling solution there? Uh, actually, flows of a similar type might exist even in the, in the, in the supersymmetric case. But then uh, uh, 
they would not have uh, a good intermediate stiletton bubble regime simply because the this sorry for going back the, these two constraints to be imposed uh, at the level of the coefficients of the linearized expansion uh, do not admit a non-trivial solution for the for the supersymmetric case so this might suggest uh, that because it does not have a good uh, intermediate bubble regime with a finite euclidean action uh, the the supersymmetric uh, vacuum they asymptote to uh, might not suffer from the same from the same decay channel but then uh, a complete analysis of this case uh, is left for future work. We are currently thinking about this. So uh, this brings me to, to my conclusions. So I hope I have convinced you that testing non-perturbative uh, stability of non-supersymmetric vacua is a challenge for quantum gravity. And nevertheless, it's of utmost importance to understand better the structure of, uh, of the swamp plant conjectures and what they can tell us about uh, the landscape in string theory. When it comes to discussing instability channels, uh, because in, in flux compactifications, we've got fluxes, we've got brains, there's a lot more uh, that I should care about before I can actually discuss uh, 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 bubble nucleation there. Dilaton bubbles might occur, might be a very general or generic feature in, uh, in string compactifications. So it would be interesting to find other uh, candidate examples to test this mechanism and see what happens. We are working on all of this, so stay tuned. Thank you for your attention and uh, sorry again for being late. Okay, thank you. Let's thank Josep for the talk. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Well, I can ask something meanwhile. Yeah. Um, first, I'm a bit confused uh, about the problems to compute the decay rate. So typically, yeah, yeah. if you have a numerical solution, you have the profiles and you can be confident that you can paste, you, know, you can glue the different regimes. In the end, to compute the decay rate for the bubble of nothing, typically it depends just on a boundary term. So it's only sensitive to the asymptotic information, I mean, the asymptotic data of the geometry and the scalar profiles. Yeah. So that is, doesn't matter that it's diverging at the bubble wall, that there is a source. So why, why you cannot, I mean, I don't know, what is the problem? I mean, why you cannot just compute the decay no, wait, 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 in this boundary uh, term? Let me stress that uh, as far as this is concerned, uh, our solution is very similar to the one by uh, Horowitz, Orgera, and Polchinski. And uh, they also have the same problem in the sense that if you, if you just uh, uh, want to evaluate the Euclidean action, in principle, that's just not finite due to the presence of the source. Uh, and the reason is that uh, Okay, so in a, in, a, in a smooth bubble geometry, you're absolutely right that the, the on-shell action is uh, zero up to a boundary term. And then uh, the boundary term, uh, you just, as you said, uh, evaluates the, the GHY term uh, at the location of the bubble wall. But uh, now due to the presence of flux, uh, that part of the geometry is cut out. So you never get to the bubble wall because there is a source before you get there. So basically, there's a, there's a spherical brain that uh, hides the bubble of nothing. So in the Witten's bubble, it's, you evaluate it at, as in, as, uh, at infinity, not at the bubble wall. Here you mean that in addition to that boundary, you also have the, the, the boundary uh, of the bubble of nothing, which now gives a non-zero contribution, unlike in Witten's bubble. And actually a divergent contribution. You have to understand how, uh, how to subtract it away. Because of course, uh, now you even have an, uh, an infinity uh, on the other um, uh, 
uh, in the asymptotic due to the presence of ADS. But there we, we've got um, holographic renormalization that tells us what to do, right? So we know exactly what kind of uh, uh, counter terms to add at infinity in order to get rid of the divergences in ADS. And here we would kind of need to introduce uh, an IR scheme to subtract the infinities uh, close to the brain. Mm -hmm. And okay. that has not been done yet. Uh, like in, uh, in Polchinski et al, for instance, what they do is to say, okay, well, yeah, the, the, the full thing we cannot evaluate because even uh, uh, there is a region in space where the supergravity approximation is not valid. Uh, so what they do is uh, to calculate the, the DBI plus, uh, plus West Zumino of, um, of the brain, of a spherical brain inside the background of a pure bubble of nothing and evaluate it in a probe limit. Mm -hmm. Okay, because so. in some sense, uh, the, the, the full solution is, uh, is basically the, the fully back reacted solution of uh, uh, placing a brain in the background of a bubble of nothing. Okay. Um, any question from the audience? I have more questions regarding the topological abstractions, but since it's a bit late, we can give the opportunity to the audience. And otherwise, I can stop the recording and whoever wants to stay can just stay. Okay, I don't see any. So let me, let's thank all of us, Josep, again. Uh, thank for you. Nice talk. And as I said, I will stop the recording. Uh, but if okay. people are interested in continuing chatting, we can stay a bit longer. Shall I maybe?